Welcome everybody. Welcome to our Can't Believe It ninth episode of Black Dance Stories. Here's a note about why we are here. Our dance world was pummeled by COVID-19 and Black dance artists are finding Welcome ways to talk. Everybody. I had to turn down the volume, sorry about that. Our dance world was pummeled by COVID-19 and Black dance artists are finding ways to talk about life during this time. Our world was further turned upside down after horrible events ensued and is ensuing nationally and globally, bringing attention yet again to the need for the Black Lives Matter movement. Black dance artists have not been quiet since. Black dance artists have been doing the work. Black dance artists continue to make work. To stay involved, we hold these weekly impromptu discussions and tell stories, Black dance stories. This is one action and we promise to all of you that we will stay involved. We are a community working together to support, uphold, highlight, and celebrate Black creatives. Tonight is our ninth episode of what we hope will be many stories told in the artist's own voices. Thanks for joining us and we hope you will embrace this series as we do. We hope you will spread the word and support each and every artist you see here and please for sure come back. Tonight, it's Leslie Parker and Wanjiru Kamuyu's turn. We will end with a film by, from our dear Nora Chipamauri, who has given this special gift to just you all here watching today. Today, you'll meet just a few from our growing BDS team. I am Charmaine Warren, I am a Jamaican, I am the great granddaughter of Ida Boyd, granddaughter of Solomon Golson and Ruby Chapman, and daughter of Theophilus Warren and my 94-year-old mother, Perlene Warren, who lives in Jamaica. I am a non-disabled black woman. I live on the stolen land of the indigenous Lenape people, now known as Montclair, New Jersey, with my husband, photographer and graphic artist, Tony Turner. Our daughter, Ashe Turner, a black ballerina with locks, is going into her junior year at Boston Conservatory. I have locks that fall to my shoulders and wrapped at my crown. I'm wearing gold earrings with cowrie shells on the end and a yellow t-shirt. Behind me are photos of our family, a large plant, a lamp, and African masks. My world is dance. And each week I am so honored to share this world with you and to be in this space with members of our indefatigable dance community. I turn it over to Kimani. Thank you, Charmaine. Hello, everyone. It is really good to be with you, be with you all here this evening. I am coming to you from the village of Harlem, also on stolen Lenape land. I am a black, non-disabled woman, and I live with my nine-year-old son, Tamaya. I am sitting in my dining room. I have a golden low-cut haircut, wearing a striped black dress, and I have my new lit ring, which gives great light. Um, I am the granddaughter of Lucille Madison. She was 104 when she passed. I teach because of her daughter of Ronald Augustus Fowlin, Jamaican warrior, and Anne Fowlin, Renaissance woman. I dance because of them. My son Tamayo keeps me present with the, trans, with the fascination of a blossoming young visual artist. So before I pass it over to Nick, I just wanna remind everybody 67 days left until the voting time, please vote. We will say this over and over, please vote. Nick. I pass it to you. Thank you, Kimani. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Hall. I am Haitian American. I'm a Black, non-disabled man. 
I was born in Brooklyn to Sheila and Curtin's Hall. My family, including my sisters Isabella and Victoria, now live in Montclair, which is on stolen Lenape land. I'm also a recent graduate of the Fordham Ailey BFA program. I'm in a white room wearing a band t-shirt and a silver necklace with a lock on it. I'm also the digital media director for Black Dance Stories. Um, just one important thing, um, we wanna bring up and remind the audience of the things going on in our country right now. One of the biggest things is Hurricane Laura and I wanna send up positive energy to all of our viewers and just everyone in the country. I wanna hope that everyone stays safe in its path. I'm gonna pass it over to Charmaine. Kimani. I'm gonna take it first and talk, just remind you, think of this, protesters and protesting and sending out just the love to embrace and protect. And I pass it over to Charmaine. And just as the last reminder, we are here because of the Black Lives Movement Matter moment. It's, it's bigger than just the moment and we are in support of the NBA's stance, dot, dot, dot. These are our people. Mm -hmm. Inhale and exhale. Mm -hmm. All right, changing of subject. We're gonna say goodbye to Kimani and Nick for a little bit as we bring in Leslie, Leslie Parker. Come on into the camera, take the mic and say hello. Charmaine, can I just yes. give the audience some quick reminders? Oh yes, please, I'm sorry, Nick. No worries, no worries. She rushing us. <laughs> Kimani, do you wanna go first? Yes, so I just wanna remind everybody, it takes a village and our village exists in front and behind the scene. We have Cynthia Tate as our publicist, wishing her family safety. Um, Gabe de Coladenu, web designer. Tony Turner, Charmaine's husband, graphic designer. And our ASL interpreters, Sharuk, Danica, and Kara. We thank you, thank you, thank you all. Nick. Um, just for the audience, we wanna remind you all to put your name in the chat. A big part of Black Dance Stories is the community aspect, so we wanna see who's with us tonight. Also, please be sure if you're not already, follow our Instagram, follow our Facebook page. And if you haven't already, please like this video, leave a comment, like I said before, and subscribe to our channel. We want you guys to be with us throughout the whole journey. And with that, grab a drink, if that's water, if that's a cocktail, a glass of wine, and cheers to Black Dance Stories. Cheers. Please donate, everyone. Please donate to us and the artists that are coming up. We also have an amazing film coming up too. And now, now is when we bring Leslie in. Thank y'all. Team BDS. Love you, love you, love you. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Yes. Thank a you. Free Leslie, and now a real Leslie. <laughs> Hi, Thank you. I appreciate that. Cheers. Yes. Welcome. Yes. Thank Please you. Please introduce yourself. Yes, so. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Charmaine, for bringing me here and for connecting me with Wanjiro, who I haven't talked to or seen in so many years. And um, I'm just really, really, really excited to be in conversation with you all. So, yes, I am Leslie Parker. I go by she, her pronouns. And I am wearing a taupe v-neck top with gold earrings with one butterfly on my left ear um, for transformation. I have locks that go down to mid back there in a ponytail. And um, I'm sitting on my couch in my studio apartment. This is my kitchen behind me. I am living at right now in the Twin Cities, which is my hometown. Uh, stolen land of the Dakota and the Ojibwe people. Um, I am the daughter of Margaret Laverne Parker, the granddaughter of... I am the daughter of Margaret Parker Hughes, <laughs> who we call... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> granddaughter of Margaret Laverne Parker and the great granddaughter of Sally Mae Dickerson. So... I am really, really on this idea of 
thinking about my childhood lately, since I've been here, I've relocated back to the Twin Cities from the East Coast, New York, Brooklyn, which I still love dearly. And since I've been here for the past couple of years, I find myself uh, just going, memories, like lots of memories flooding me, going down memory lane. And with the times that we're in now, particularly being in St. Paul, Minneapolis, that are really close together. I mean, literally right now where my uh, apartment is, it's on the one street that <laughs> separates me from Minneapolis in St. Paul. So if I cross that street, like a, less than a block away, I'm in Minneapolis. So I'm back and forth working throughout the Twin City area, metro area all the time. And so I'm always thinking about lately just how these memories of being here, again, returning to my hometown, how they, how I'm, I'm affected, like full circle. So I got a bike recently. Yes. So now I just... Yes. <laughs> In my car so much here we drive a lot like you know it's just uh, we have more space where we have to drive more often so i was like i gotta get a bike so i've been riding my bike around my old neighborhood where i grew up and i was able to go by my my grandmom's house that uh-huh. wants her house and that house was also my grandmom's sister's house and she gave it to her, but it's not in our family anymore, but yet the area is still over there. So it's called the Rondo neighborhood, which is where I'm originally from. And the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul is a historical, historically black neighborhood that had black businesses, black dentists, doctors. We didn't have to go outside of our neighborhood for really anything. And we preferred not to at the time because we just felt safer together in our, in our bubble, in our neighborhood in Rondo. And there we had black barbers, we had like grocery store, I mean, everything, everything, all black owned homes. Like the neighborhood was very um, rich in terms of what all it offered to the community. And then, you know, the Highway 94 came through, cut through it, demolished the neighborhood. Um, Literally, you could find that when when gentrification was coming through, family members would come and see that their houses had holes. They were just without their knowing that someone was just going to come and just push them out like that. Like it was just really traumatic for the community. And these, these, this is part of my lineage. So going back there on my bike, knowing that the neighborhood has changed somewhat and just, just really trying to unearth memories of what it was meant for me to be in that neighborhood as a child and longing for that again. Um, longing for what that would what that feels like and in the Rondo community it formed me and shaped me as a dance artist in such a way that I remember when I was going into elementary schoolish time and um, we had a Rondo Day celebration parade and that was really the beginnings of my my dance uh, so I was part of the inaugural Rondo Day Parade March. So this Rondo Day Parade was created to, comm- to to remember Rondo Days and the families and the the history of that area. So as a kid, I would march every year. We would march for Rondo Days. Each group, youth groups from different neighborhoods that had lineage from different neighborhoods and Rondo would get together and rehearse and practice to come together and have this drill team competition. The drill team competition got so popular that people from Chicago, different places within the region of the Midwest would come and compete. And this was our way of then bringing all the blackness, all the black people from now, not only from the Twin Cities, but from Chicago, from Detroit, from all these different places and we would just 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 go mad in terms of drill team and dancing and being together. And that was really a part of what shaped me in the way that I think about community, in the way that I think about collective activism, the way that I think about movement and the need and what's the need of dance and music in our communities. 
that help us to thrive and express ourselves. And having that community behind me to support me as I decided that this is something that I want to continue, this love, this Black love, this, this beauty that I hold dear to, I want to continue thriving um, with this idea that I can, I can dance, I can be a dancer, I can, I can, you know, I can make this my life. Um, and so I say that to say that's the foundation, the memories that I'm holding with me now. And just to say that bringing to us to the current moment, I've been reading Alice Walker's book, uh, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. I say. Yeah. So that also has been bringing up, you know, memories for me in terms of thinking about my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and what it meant to grow up in my neighborhood and to and and remembering. And so I want to show you a picture. This is my mom. Oh, my mommy, me, and this is my brother. They look like twins. They're just like, I'm, I'm a chocolate one, more chocolate. But yeah, so they, uh, they still hold Rondo. My mom still holds Rondo very much in her heart. My brother does too, um, because of he's my older brother. So he tells me things that I don't even remember. But going back to this book, and thinking about my family and the memories that we hold, I'm just going right into it, saving the life that is our own, the importance of models in the artist's life. I, I, mean, I don't really have a whole lot of words to describe how, how much this is impacting me right now in terms of what it meant to, to search for models as a dance artist, as a young dance artist, as a black young dance artist in my neighborhood where we didn't really have any dance companies that I could look to or um, dance artists that were based here that had uh, aspirations of going outside of the neighborhood or that did at the time growing up. And so I full circle thinking for a long time, being in search of looking for like models and people who I who I think that I could relate to as a black as a young black dance artist and then coming to realize in this moment all the models I did have even though it wasn't necessarily located in one area or place but the models that I had from traveling the models that I have from my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother the models that I've had um, through that community activists who nurtured me and who continued to tell me, we may not be in dance, but we know you're a star and we know that you should follow your dream and do whatever it is that you have in your heart to do. And if dance is in your heart to do, then that's what you need to be doing. So go and do that. that. <laughs> and so by any means necessary, that's pretty much how the, the track happened, right? <laughs> so like, and here I am again. Oh, Leslie, that's beautiful. I know you shared some of Rondo with me before, so it's really nice to, for you to share it with everybody else. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, inhale, exhale. So, Leslie. Yes. I'm the interrupting person. Yes. As I told you. I'm going to do some shout outs. Mm -hmm. Let's bring one Jiru in. As everyone already knows, it's a longer night because we have a special thing to share. What, Jiru? Got Leslie and one Jiru tonight. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Yay. Let me do a shout out. Mm. Risa Steinberg is in the house. Jennifer Harge is in the Yay. house. Yatande is here. Eva Yasantewa. Renee Redding Jones. Elizabeth Zimmer. Welcome, Elizabeth. Kate Mattingly, a regular. Amy Casello. Ann Davidson, our regulars. Omar De Jesus, yes, welcome. Molly Silverberg, yay, Molly. Laura Marchese, my partner in crime. Sule Adams, welcome. Andrew Sloth, what? Welcome, everybody. Please drop your questions in the chat. We are here to answer them. I'm going to leave Juan Jiru and Leslie alone for a little bit. I'm out. 
<laughs> I'm not far. <laughs> Oh my God, Leslie, it's great to see you. We danced Hello. together years ago with Miss Tanya. Yeah, Philadelphia, Stand Pipe, Painted Bride. Oh my God. That I'll was never amazing. forget it. I'll never forget my experience with you, Angero. You have been an influencer in my life. Oh. You really have. I'm remembering you. I remember you even going further back to transitioning from urban bush women. Um, I was, I, I just remember I was, I forget where we were though, but I remember the time, I forget where we were. It was an audition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. And uh, Nora was actually coming in while you were transitioning out. Oh yeah, it was the Bushwomen audition and Nora was auditioning at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. many years ago. So I remember you from back then and then to have danced with you with Tanya Isaac was a, a special moment to really be, you know, to feel your your power and your creativity. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was really great fun to share space with you. I called Tanya immediately after when you voice booked me yesterday. I was like, oh my God, I knew her face looked really familiar. Like, what piece did we do? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so it was standby for sure, for sure. Yeah. And, and so how long did you live in Brooklyn? Nine years. And so going back home, how has, has that been? It's been one hell of a transition. It has been. I'm not even going to front on that. And um, I came back here to teach at the University of Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. So I came right in to an intensive situation in teaching full time, lecturer there. And then, um, you know, the, then all hell broke loose just, you know, George Floyd, COVID. Right. So the transition, the, 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 the coming in hasn't really felt like there's been a calm, <laughs> a right. calm landing. Ah. It's been quite the transition, learning a lot, learning a lot. Does it still feel like home for you or? That's part of having that time, getting the bike and going out, you know, and just touching the ground, being a part of the neighborhood and just having these memories come back. It's starting, the, the, the feeling of home is, is coming back more to me. Mm -hmm. Although, speaking of Tanya Isaac, home is where I am, you know, always feeling that uh, that in me from having moved and transitioned on the East Coast of Philadelphia and then moving to Brooklyn and feeling very, very close to Brooklyn, but having returned here. Yeah, those, those childhood memories, mm. it's calling me home. Interesting, because I'm doing a, my new solo is on immigration, mm -hmm. um, immigration stories and nomadic stories, travelers, floaters. So it's just really interesting to, talking to people about the sensation of home, where is home, what is home, um, and also the return, if people have returned, or will they ever return? Right. Um, and how, how, if you've left your space where you called home at one point and returned to it years later, does it still feel like home or do you have to readjust? Right. Because Brooklyn and the Twin Cities are very different. Very different. Yeah. Culturally, mental, this in mental uh, aspects as well. Worldview is very different. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel I've really had to understand what it means to to let myself expand, you know, and to, to, to expand my capacity mm. in terms of what all that I can hold mm. with memory as well. Right. You know, so that um, I'm not so rigid and hold it, trying to hold on to one idea of what I think home should be. Right. But I'm always thinking about how home can become, becoming at the same time, you know, with right. trying to work with change versus right. again. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because I remember when my we moved from Kenya, my birth home, uh, a while ago now. Oh my gosh. Um, and the first time we went back home was ten years after. And I remember telling a dear friend, I was like, Oh my god, I feel like a, a floating tourist in my own home. It's supposed to be home. Why does it not feel like home? 
Yes. And uh, that really bothered me. And then uh, my family was with me for, I think it was three weeks. And then I stayed at home for a week without family. And I was just with my friends and we were doing everyday errands and running around, just doing life, not, not, not really focused on going to this site and seeing this family member and all those things that come with visiting. Mm. And then I started to feel like I, I could be, whew, okay, now my feet are landing. Now I feel like I can be part of the fabric again. Like I am part of the fabric. But yeah. It was really strange coming back after so long. Uh, yeah. And holding the space in, of home so dear and in such a bubble as well, because I think we fantasize home as well. <laughs> we do. I know I do. I mean, I romanticized what it meant to move to the East Coast. That was like, OK, no. <laughs> and romanticize what was home as I was trying to shift and figure out what home was there. And then coming back here is so different. Physically, it's different. People are different. You are different. Um, everything is different yeah. I'm different yeah yeah, yeah. I feel you on that one yeah. and so what's are you in you're in development right now of this piece that you're working on yeah it's uh yeah. we're at the we'd say three quarter way done so I'm just hoping that we don't go into confinement again and that I can just get done with the work <laughs> just, that's yeah. my prayer just to get done with the work and if we have to be reconfined again okay but I want my work to be done you know yeah Coming into yeah. the space and creating was really challenging in the beginning. And that's something that I did want, I thought to ask you actually, because I've always seen you as a very creative person. I mean, not, you know, with dance, but not only dance, but mm -hmm. just jewelry, just, <laughs> yeah, right? I remember. I so I like, <laughs> you got a good memory. <laughs> hey. Work. So, but I'm, I'm just, I'm curious to hear from you with the time that we have how are you feeling um, about creativity right now? What is, what is fueling your creativity? How are you maintaining your creative juices during all this turbulence that we're going through with COVID and a revolution? Yes, it's exhausting. Um, so I remember it was May 25th going into the studio for the first time. And the first week was great. I mean, I was like, yeah, out of the house. I can feel like I'm normal again to a studio. But I was reconfined. I was a, it's a solo. So mm. then the second and third week, I was hitting my head against the wall. I was really stuck. I called a mentor. She was like, this is good. I called Tanya. I told her I'm stuck. She said, oh, this is very good. I'm like, hi, is this good? <laughs> <laughs> this feeling here, I do not like it at all. And uh, then I was in my fourth week and, and of, of course I'm getting more space than I ever thought I would ever. Initially, I wasn't going to have this much space or time. So I'm like, yeah. then I'm feeling guilty that I'm in studios and I'm like, but I have nothing. Like I'm wasting time. Someone else could be here, you know, benefiting from. And then I, on the, in the fourth week, I decided, okay, I'm going to call in a, a choreographic coach friend. He came in and I told him, I said, you just need to kick me in the butt. I need all exercises. I need all games. I don't know, just throw, just do whatever needs to be done. And mm -hmm. after those three days, I could finally find my breath again. Because, wow. you know, I mean, in all the situation, we all have been stripped of our live theater and cinema and museums, all our sources of inspiration and our life our performing live, our creating with other people, just the rhythm of our lives is shifted. So that really, I was just like, whoa, this is intense. This is really intense. And I was really glad when I talked to a few artist friends that they were going through the same thing. I was like, okay, good. Huh. But in the confinement yeah. itself, I was actually quite creative. I did a whole happy dance video. And then <laughs> I did, I, I, cultivate I mean I collected all these stories for my work I was very productive and then when they said go to the studio I was like oh there's a virus outside <laughs> <laughs> really are you sure are we ready yet <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 I totally feel you yeah I mean, the juices I was, are, are flowing again now and that's why I'm like if there's ever another confinement I just want to be I want to be done so that I don't have to go back into the hitting my head against the wall thing Oof, yeah you know. yeah yeah I understand I mean I just I'm fortunate that I have a theater here who let me in as nice. the only artist in residence oh sweet so you can continue your juices flowing 
Yeah, but it didn't, it took a minute. <laughs> right. It took a minute to get used to, you know, and to being in, in that in that environment because it's three blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. Ooh. Yeah, so even though I'm going and my juice, get my juice is flowing, but then again, it's still in the same area. Yeah, and it's a, it's a theater I was working with before pre his murder. So now I'm returning because that's where I'm in residence. And so, I mean, I could go on for a long time about that as well. Uh, yeah, one, one of the art room that they have, they've taken a lot of the artifacts that, I mean, there's, it's been vandalized periodically. Um, and so they try to recover a lot of the artifacts that are at his memorial. Mm -hmm. And so the theater has an art room where they take the different artifacts and try to restore them mm -hmm. and save them, even down to the little piece of paper. They're like vacuuming and trying to hold mm -hmm. on to the paperwork. Wow. Yeah. Oh my oh gosh. gosh. Well, use uh, that. Leslie, I don't together. know that I knew that you were that close. Well, the theater, well, yeah, I mean, the, the theater was that close. The theater is three blocks away, but I'm still really close, even in St. Paul, to the hot, the, the epic center of where a lot of the protesting and a lot of the vandalism and has happened. Yeah. And it's time to bring Wanjiru in, but I also want the audience to know that what you said before we went live is that now you're back on curfew because it's work, it's heightened. Yeah, it's heightened yeah. because of Jake Blake, Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Yeah. So I'm like, and you know, I've been trying to tune out lately because I just need some, trying to figure out how to create a bubble of self, you know, a self bubble for self preservation and self care. Thanks. And I'm just walking down my apartment hallway and my phone, you know, just starts going nuts. And I'm like, oh, curfew at 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. Because there's, they, they're, you know, Target was blocked off. There's more looting. Uh, everything is happening last night in terms of going into different stores, departments. I mean, it was just all, it was reactivated. Mm. We're here, family. We're here. Mm. It's, it's real. Thanks, Very Leslie. Real. This is a horrible note to transition on. I but know, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll be back. Thank you, Leslie. No. <laughs> Yeah, horrible. But welcome, Wanjiru. Welcome. Oh, Cheers. Nice. See you in a little bit, Leslie. And introduce Leslie. yourself. And, and I have to tell you, Wanjiru, Laurie Pritchard goes, Laurie Pritchard is here and she says, Bonsoir. Oh, bonsoir. David Binder is here. Jay Bowie is here. Tamika is here. Nag Nagala Maximilian is here. And Carol Marie Nag Ross is here. She's from Uganda, yay! Oh, yay! Nagamala. Oh, Nagamala. Oh, welcome, Wanjiru. Introduce yourself and just tell all the people about the loveliness that's going on. Oh, gosh, and loveliness. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for bringing me into the fold as well. It's really a pleasure, really an honor and a pleasure. Oh, when, you, okay. when you say come, we go, huh? Because <laughs> for everyone, I live in Paris, France, so it's it's like what time is it? Midnight thirty. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here. Really, really honored to be here. Uh, my name is Wajiro Mobi Eugenia Wakamuyu, and I believe my parents are on with us tonight as well. <gasps> I, salute you. I salute you. Um, I am Agikoyo. I am African American. I am woman. And I float between worlds, Paris, New York, Nairobi, Europe, the US, Africa. I am the child of Dr. Kamoyo Wakangeve and Mrs. Joki Sandra Eugenia Wakamoyo. I am the grandchild of Gina Bella, Eugenia Annie Bostock, Charles O'Neill Jackson Jr., Samuel Peavy, Wajiro Lois, Wakamuyu and Wakangeve, Wakangeve and Shem Kangeve. I am Auntie Tuwere Kamuyu Jackson Ojuolo and to Robin Moulin Guyot. 
I am the second mama and auntie to Naomi and Eve Isaac Hyman, Tanya's babies. I am beloved to Cyril Alexandre Moulin, who is my partner in life and a really quite a blessing. Like my father said, I made a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am le belle sœur, la belle sœur. In, instead of saying, in French, instead of saying sister-in-law, you would say beautiful sister. So I am the beautiful sister of Charlotte Alexandra uh, Moulin and also to Oliver Ojiambo Ojuolo. I am le be la belle fille or daughter-in-law, beautiful daughter to Philippe and Régine Moulin. I am the sister of Modoni Vivian Wakamuyu and Wanjiko Francis Wakamuyu. I think I've, I think I've done the list, I believe. <laughs> Shay. You know, so, um, and I am in a space, I'm in our bureau, our office, our library. There are loads of books around me. There's, uh, my beloved really loves wood. So everything is like a, in wood. So behind here, uh, behind these closed doors is a computer and then you have files and everything in here. There's a bit of a wooden ladder that takes you up to high, high space to go get books. And by the way, I don't have enough space for my books, um, but his books are everywhere. Um, just for him to know this. Huh? <laughs> and uh, I'm wearing a white t-shirt with um, a print of actually the inside of uh, a tree that I recently got in Berlin when I was in residency in Berlin. I have, and it's white and gray. And then I have a galea on my head with which has gray, blues, yellows, and reds in it. I wear glasses, which have turquoise, um, uh, what do we call these? Uh, the side, Frames. the thing that goes over your ears. Frames, <laughs> frames. Very, very good. And then around uh, the rims are, are black, like um, uh, tortoise shell black. And uh, I think that's about, I have lipstick on. I was very excited to put lipstick on today. I don't think I've worn lipstick in a very long time since the confinement really. And I have earrings. I have um, little dangly earrings that I got in South Africa when I was in Johannesburg in 2015. So, um, and I am in Paris. I have a few notes about the land in which I am in. So I'm gonna read them for you. So bear with me. Paris is more than 2,000 years old. Gauls of the Parisi ethnic group settled here between 250 and 200 BC and founded a fishing village on an island in the river that represents the present day Ile de la Cité, the center around which Paris developed. The Frankish king Clovis I took Paris from the Gauls in 494 CE and later made his capital there. Known in ancient times as Luteticia or Lutece, Paris was conquered by Julius Caesar in 52 BC and, ex and ex existed as a regional center under the Romans. In nine, 987, Hugh Capet, Count of Paris, who became one of the kings of France, and under his successors, the city's position as the nation's capital became established and has become the political, intellectual, educational, and cultural hub of today's France, the capital city. A city filled with loads of history, history that some of, the, uh, some of it they do not want to discuss. They like to, they tend to put um, horrific, um, traumatic, inhumane, barbaric history under the rug. So it's a space where it's now just becoming acceptable or even that you're listened to when you talk about systemic racism in this space. So that's my story. Um, I want to just give some, a little homage to, the, I have my little notes, a homage because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my mother, Jockey Sandra Eugenia Wakamoyo, putting me into a ballet class when I was eight years old and I fell in love with it. And uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. It was to be a professional dancer. I didn't know what that mean, meant. I mean, we're in Nairobi, Kenya, there was no role model. Like Leslie was saying, role models. What, what role model was? <laughs> and, and my dad had asked, told, my mom later tells me that my dad asked, uh, so how long is this going to last? And uh, she said, well, maybe her whole life. And she was absolutely right without even 
knowing. So she was prophetizing and she is a praying warrior. So, and then another person I would love to bring into the space and honor and who gave me my big break and who has, without her, I wouldn't be here today in the practices and approaches and the world view as an artist, as a woman, um, is Jawali Willa Josaler from Urban Bush Women. Ashe. Yes, yes. Jawali opened the door. She saw the potential in me and she opened the doors. And I was with her for six years intensely in the studio, on the road. And I'm a Bush woman forever, for life, for life. So she asked me, I will, I will come too at midnight. <laughs> My time. <laughs> And also, I have to give a shout out to my favorite cousin in the whole wild world, Kermit O'Neill Bostock, who actually housed me for two years in New York when I came to New York. Um, without his free housing and free food and love and support, I don't know what I would have done in New York City in the top of my career. So those people are very much a part of my journey and my family and my community as well. Um, so yeah, so that's the story. So what I'm working think, on, tell me. Do you think you can, well, we're under confinement, as you say, but coming back, you usually come once a year, no? Yeah, usually I come once a year and I try to go to Kenya at least once every other year. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't been able to come back. I came back last year to celebrate Urban Bushwoman's 35th anniversary, which was really fun and dance Bati Moves again. Honey, Bati Moves is in my body like never before. Like I thought it, it's not gone. It is just here. <laughs> 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 we did a little rehearsal with Shannon. I was like, oh my God, I, re I, I really do know this dance. Um, so I came last year, but I would love to come back. But at the current time, gosh, who knows when, no? Huh? Yeah, who knows when. But yeah, and I would love to go back to Kenya as well. Um, Kenya is calling me more and more, and especially in the climate that we're in. And at the top of the murder of George Floyd, I, people asking me, how are you? How are you feeling? And I was just like, you know what? I told Cyril, I said, you know, I, mean, I want to go home. I want to go home where everyone looks like me, where there's a reflection of me and everything and everyone. They know how to say my name. There's no problem. I, there's no code language. I, culturally, we get it. Um, racism is not in the air and I can have my shoulders go. So uh, yeah, I'm thinking more and more of how to create space in Kenya that's sustainable that I can go back for a few months out of every year and just have my feet on Mother Earth, Africa, <laughs> land, you know. And, and you started thinking this because of the George Floyd move, the Black Lives Matter movement. You would go back, but now you want to go back and stay longer. Um, yeah, and it's something that's been marinating in my spirit for a while now. And my father's always like, when are you going to start your idea? When are you going to start your idea? I'm like, I'm getting to it. And uh, I need to, I was recently on a panel, Africa Speaks on the, uh, the challenges of being a, a female dancer on the continent. Uh, and it just, you know, it just is sealed with me that I need to really strategize and get back home. You know. mm. I need to, I need to do that. It's important. I have enough in my arsenal now. I like, I have enough experience now that I can go back and help build bridges and bridges within the continent and also in the diaspora. That's important to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's my, it's my soul space. Home is the US and home is Kenya. So. I know you were talking with with Leslie about finding out what home is or deciding on defining what home is. That's a hard one now, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, and you know, with the work that I'm doing now, you, I ask myself the same questions I'm asking the people who are sharing their stories with me is where is home? And, and so of course, Kenya is home. When we moved to the US, I felt like an immigrant. I didn't feel it was my home. It was my mama's home. Uh, now it's my home. Um, and Paris for me is a, say, un passage. It's a, it's a space in where I am. It's a space I enjoy for the most part. It's contradictory, it's sexy, it's um, got its inequalities and injustices just like everywhere else. 
Um, it's romantic. It's where my sweetheart is. Uh, it's where my life is at the moment. Do I consider it home home? Nah. <laughs> And I have the right to vote now. I have the passport, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's not the same sensation as Kenya or the US. It's just, yeah, it's a different vibration. It feels, it feels transit. It feels like I'm in transit on some level, even though it's a very long transition. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I arrived with a, with a job actually with Stephanie Batten Bland, actually, who was your, on your first series, your first episode. Stephanie and I worked on the same musical, A la recherche de Josephine Baker, looking for Josephine Baker. And uh, I thought I was going to be here for, I mean, it was a tour with Josephine and then I booked Lion King and then I thought, oh, I'll be here for a year with Lion King, that's it, and then I'll go home. No, it's been 13 years that Asha Thomas and myself have been here. Asha Thomas from Ailey. We've been, we look up and we're like, girl, <laughs> It's been 10 years. Now it's 12. Now it's 13. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. And it's lovely to learn another language. Um, it's interesting to be in this space during uh, the confinement and George Floyd and now um, Jacob Blake. And because people are becoming much more vocal about the injustices that are happening in France. And that's really good because in the beginning, people really didn't speak that much. Um, it was uh, a little bit in the air, like oh, we don't want to make people feel guilty of our past and we are united, liberté, égalité, fraternité, mm. uh, liberty, e equality and, and brotherhood. Um, and I remember getting my passport and then they're so proud to tell you that you're in this space and that you've become a citizen and, and it's égalité and liberté and fraternité. I'm thinking to myself, in the street, it ain't that. <laughs> I mean, and the street is so not that. So when people started to take the streets in protest of um, the murder of George Floyd and in support of the Black Lives Matter, uh, I was really, really hoping that they would take a reflection on self and the construct of systemic racism in this country. And they did. And so that was really good. I mean, because brutality and uh, racial profiling by the police is it's here. It happens. You know, they love to go, but you're you're making everything very American. And no, it happens here. Just look, open your eyes, you know. And the thing I do I have learned is that when talking about issues, such sensitive issues such as race, um, in a space also that thinks that they are not as racist because they melange a lot. They have a lot of interracial or interethnic or intercultural um, relationships. And even as a colonizer, they were very into intermingling. Um, they, I have to learn that their, their relationship to race is very different than the US. And I just ask questions to then lead them down to another pathway of thinking. And hopefully that opens up some, some more dialogue. But now there are artists like Bintu Dembele, uh, Robin Ordine, who's from South Africa, living in Berlin. She's a mentor of mine and work helping me with my work as well. Um, Dirk Corel, uh, there's uh, Kudus Onyeku from Nigeria. There's some artists out here who are really vocal and really trying to pave the the path to open up space for us, more space for us, because it's very homogeneously white and casting and in, and what you see on stage, it's, or they have the black project or the Asian project or the Latino project. And then after that, you're not thought about. Um, wow. which I think, yeah, I find that very, very unfortunate. You know, I'm working now, I worked on a theater piece called Love is in the Hair by a um, director, Jean-Francois Auguste. And uh, it's all about our hair, natural hair. And also tied into it is identity and asking people um, to go deeper into their thinking of ordinary racism. And uh, the cast is all brown and black uh, bodies. It's beautiful. And uh, he is not doing just his black project. So there are other <gasps> projects that he has involved our bodies in, which I'm like, salute, salute, salute. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this piece has really been good because it also opens up space where 
I remember having a conversation with the artist and, and sharing with them that the question of tu viens de où, where do you come from, is a, it's a bit of a stingy question in the French context when you're asking someone who is non-typically traditionally um, imagined as French, meaning white. Um, and because there is a thing of, bah, I'm second, first, second, third generation French. What's wrong with you? I come from Paris. Uh, so you have people who go, ah, I come from Paris, je, je viens de Paris. Ah bah, mais avant, where and from before, where were you from before? Because they're busy trying to exotify you as well and uh, put you in categories and everything. And I told them, I said, you know, it's really interesting this uh, reaction to the question of where you from, because in the US, I find that we ask that question, but it's based not necessarily always about what you look like, but how you sound. Like what's, what's where am I traveling? with your voice, like what's your accent telling me, you know? So I never get offended. I actually really love telling people, I'm from Kenya, I'm from the US, and here they love to go, ah, t'es Americana, ah, t'es bien. <laughs> ah, bah oui, but I'm from also from Kenya. Baku, Canada? No, Kenya, 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 Anglophone Africa, Kenya. Ah, okay, but the American in you, I'm like, good gosh. <laughs> Could wow. You another Kenyan in me as well so yeah it's a it's an interest, interesting space to to be in and have to these discussions and to also be in a space where you face the same things you would in the U.S. just in a different framework mm -hmm. wow well here I come again yes. and we're going to bring Leslie back and it's time to bring up some of the statements. Remember, they're statements, they're not all questions. Yes. But bringing Leslie back, because I, I want to go back to this question about, actually, let me put it in your words. Where do you come from? Right, Leslie? Right. Where do you come from? Right. And then I have a question from Yotande, but would either of you like to talk a little bit about that? I know, Wanjiru, you kind of started. No, you did start. Yeah. Actually, yeah. pause while you think about that. Douglas Hall is in the house. Nicholas Va Nicole Van Ox is in the house. Stacey Dinner is here. Jamal Barnes is here. Oh. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Lots of friendly people. Always. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you being here. True. But yeah, this question, where do you come from? As a Jamaican, that's one of those questions, right? For me. Yeah, when you when you talk about that, Mama Charmaine, I'm always like sh struck by the stories when you do tell stories about Jamaica. When we have opportunities to hear about well, when I've had the opportunity to hear about your mom and see pictures and and learn more about you in terms of who you who you are versus the way that you may be perceived. And I'm not saying you per se, but just in general, the way that we are perceived, a lot of people just perceive where you're from, like you were saying, based on what they hear, what they, what you look like, your skin color, what, what, um, what shade, I mean, the, the list goes on. But when I think about where I'm from, I mean, I'm, I'm going to the first thought that came to my mind, which was womb, right? Womb space. And so when I think about womb space, that opens up these, 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 these other feelings, these more poetic feelings mm -hmm. about the womb space. You know, what does it mean to be held? What does it mean to, to be nurtured? What does it mean to be nourished? What does it mean to be pushed in, into a, a space of courage and fearlessness, right? So where do we come from? How do we come from a space where we're not, where we're in one way of being and pushed into another way of being where we have to confront things that not necessarily um, are, are within the womb space. The womb space prepares us. The womb space is what gives us our strength. The womb space is what gives us our love. So I come from love. I come from a space of strength. I come from a space of fearlessness and knowing that wherever I get, if, if whatever I feel myself propelled into, whatever space I'm propelled into, wherever that is, Conscious, uh, psychologically, spiritually, physically, demographically, um, cosmically, that I have everything I need because of the womb space that nurtured me to be 
all that I want to be. Ashe. 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 Wanjiru, your parents are here. You see? <laughs> they are here from They're Kenya. Fantastic. They're fantastic. They're living in Michigan. They're living in, in a Michigan. little town called Ypsilanti, where my mom grew up. Ashe. Oh, my gosh. And I think <laughs> I see a, a note that says Diane is here from Kimani. I think it might be the one and only Diane McIntyre. Not sure. We love you, Mama Diane, oh, yeah. queen of all queens. Mm, yeah. Lots of people are here. Wanjiru, did you want to talk more about this? Where do you come from? And I'm going to scroll down a little bit and find some more questions. Yeah, I mean, even in diving in, in my work, I go further in trying to dis. where do I come from? Yes, womb. And not just being Kenyan, I am Agikuyu. That is my ethnic group for, for thanks to my father and African-American thanks to my mother. Um, and so, and being grounded and rooted in that, even though I don't speak language, like I don't speak Kiswahili fluently and I do not speak Kikuyu at all, my father's language at all. Um, and whenever I go, whenever I go back, I don't care what country on the continent, there's always someone who's trying to challenge my Africanness, my Kenyanness. I'm like, if you dare, <laughs> I'm like, are you mad? Let me tell you, come off the continent, then you become even more proud and more Kenyan, more African than you've ever been. So don't yeah. question me just because of my lack of language. Like, don't, don't, yeah. don't do that, you know. So here's a question for Leslie. Are there important differences for you about dance and dance community in New York where you worked for a while and the Twin Cities? I think this, this is Mama Eva Ya asked that question, I think. Are there important differences? Mm -hmm. It's not important. <laughs> I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say important. The reason why I wouldn't say important is because for me, dance is dance. Had you asked me that question before I moved to the East Coast, I might have said something different. I might be like, whoa, yo, I had to leave and see more black people, first of all, because believe it or not, coming outside of my bubble, when you come outside of that Rondo community, there were no black people in, the, in Minnesota, really. Like we're only like 3% of the population. So my moving out of here was also about finding what is black dance? Where is it? What, how, can, how can I expand this concept of what black dance is in my own mind and in my own body? So I needed to just go and experience it wherever I could and, and understanding. But what I will give this, the Rondo neighborhood um, credit for is that I already have a sense of it where I didn't, I wasn't asking what is it? Mm. I knew what it, I know what it is. I just wanted more of it. And I just wanted to keep going. So going to the East Coast, what it did, it provided me more information, more voices, more variety of voices and coming from the Midwest, right? Because when you're on the East Coast and you're in New York, you got voice, I, like I didn't have access to travel continent to continent and country to country. I was lucky to even get from one block to the next when I was living here, right? So to even get to the East Coast was a big deal for somebody like me. And to hear all these different dialects just on the East Coast was pretty incredible for me and expanded my capacity to understand what it means to hold more information in my body around Blackness and Black dance. So what's important for me was just always knowing that there's multi there's, there's more, more ways than a few to experience Black dance and Blackness. And that's what New York gave me. Okay, I'm going to throw this one to you, Wanjiru. I know you talked about it a little bit. And you and I talked a little bit also about negritude. Mm -hmm. But you are having to work to find a home there. Yes? Mm. A Black yeah. home. A Black home. Let me expound on that point. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I always say that actually when I came to France is the first time I ever felt exotified, like really exotified. Um, so spaces are there for you when it's the project. And then the space disappears when the project is done. 
Um, so in 2014, where I was like, okay, I have to sit my behind in Paris and stop touring so much so I can create this network, do this contemporary dance thing, go back into company work, do my own work. It was the, it was the worst. It was the absolute worst because of many things. Okay, so culturally, it's very narrow in, in how they view you. So you dance, you sing, you act, that's just way too many things. What do you really do? And oh, in the dance, what do you really, really do? So then you go to all these auditions and you find, I, I went to 12 auditions and get one dog on job. And every, every audition, we were all cut who were brown and black bodies. And I remember one sister in the corner crying her eyes out. And I said to her, I said, you know what? It's time that we just do our own shit. <laughs> I was like, because I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm so done. I'm done. I'm done. So finding a space for yourself, you have to carve it out and carve it out hard yeah. for yourself because it's just not, it's not given to you. It's not, it's, it's not. Okay. This is a crazy question, but it aligns with what both of you just said. Yotande said, are we ready? That's the question. What? <laughs> And, and, and I can flip it too and say, are they ready? Y'all have been doing the work, but I pose that to you all. Mm, and we don't have that much time left, believe it or not, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, they best be ready because we come in and we still come in. So I don't care if you are ready or not ready. I'm here. Yes, here. We are here. Here, been here, doing here. the work, have done the work. So we are here, continuing to always be here. Work. Oh my gosh. Uh, Yatande said it's a fierce idea, Wanju. Going home to do the work. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. And Diane McIntyre. Oh my gosh. Can we all say this together? One, two, three. Love you, Diane. One, love. two, three. Love, love you, Diane. Diane. She says love to us. Mm. Thank you for the stories. Oh, we love you for giving us stories so much and so many more. Yeah. Come on back in, Kimani and Nick. So tonight, everyone, Nora Chipamori has given us the gift of a film that she just recently made, and it premiered. It's a world premiere here. We are beyond lucky. And I don't want to say more other than to say that it's a gift. It's a gift. And Nick, do you want to say more? Because I'll keep talking. Gotcha, gotcha. But because it's a gift, we want to make it super exclusive. So I'm going to be sharing a unlisted YouTube link with everyone in the chat. And that link is going to be active until 7.45. So a very small window to watch the premiere. So after that time, you guys won't be able to see the video. So I'm going to give you some time to take a step away, grab a snack, refill your drinks, and then watch the video. And then again, at 7.45, it's going to be gone. And don't forget, Charmaine. Oh, I did forget. I did forget. Hold on. Oh, wait. So something special. Not that tonight isn't special, but something special. We get to announce our September lineup. Whoop, whoop. B.B. Miller and Kyle Abraham. What? Nia Love and Maria Bauman Morales. Camille A. Brown and Jason Samuel Smith. What? Kayla Hamilton and Jamal Barnes. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank Leslie yes. Wanjiru. Thank you. My heart, <laughs> our heart is full. Did you have anything else that you two would like to say before we go? An honor, an honor. It's been an honor. It's yeah. really, and I thank you for the space because I'm usually, I try to be in New York every year because people be forgetting you still dance. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy to be able to share and to, to be visible as well and to support and see you all after so many years and meet you, Nick, as well. Yeah, yeah. Feeling the same. It's just really good to have a space to come together and to see the faces I haven't seen in a while in the in the chat and just be connected. That chat is raunchy and raucous, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Please be mindful of all that is happening around us. 
stay with each other, support each other, reach out to e for, for all those folks that you don't normally reach out to. Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. our world. Keep it close to your heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Charlie. And don't forget to vote. Yes. Okay. Yes. Bye, everybody. Stay tuned. Uh, Nick is going to drop the link in a second. <laughs>